Katie, appreciate that. Um, great to be on with you all. So, yes, I'm Matt Bryan. I'm the player registration manager for the RFU. I am fast approaching my 20th year with the RFU. So that's that's literally a couple of months away now. So I've been uh, a rugby development officer and that done competitions roles. And more latterly, over the past couple of years, I've been project managing and overseeing the implementation of the new adult player registration, which is coming uh, this summer. So great to be on with you all. Fantastic to hear the contributions of all of your volunteers. Always makes me feel a bit emotional. So that's that's really, really good to be close to that. Um, what I'm going to uh, take you through now uh, are some of the details around adult player registration and obviously calling out some specific and key points that are relative to the university sector. So what we'll have a look at, if you if you want to go back and have a look at some of the more um, historical kind of information that we've been putting out on adult player registration, which has been coming out to the game now for the best part of 18 months, what I'll do when I finish my bit is I'll link into the chat some webinars that we've been doing, particularly over the past six months, which can give you a little bit more, bit, bit more flavour about where this has come from. Some of you may be on the call uh, and potentially were with me April last year um, when we did a, a presentation down at Saracen. So as you can see, it's a, a pretty big project that's been um, in development for quite some time. And as Katie says, we're really delighted to be getting this underway as pretty much the gateway of part of our digital transformation piece and starting to establish a much better digital relationship with our players and obviously better understanding the health of the game. Uh, you know, some figures have been quoted there at the start to have around about the 10% of the playing population playing rugby at universities. Hopefully having all of this data at our fingertips will be able to put us all in a better place to articulate that as best as we possibly can and ensuring, of course, that the university sector gets its uh, fair share of uh, any resources that are going. So we'll look at some key principles of adult player registration. Well, then, as I say, go in and have a look at what it looks like for universities specifically. I'll talk a little bit around what we've done on player testing uh, and some further testing. I mean, I'll cover that further testing now, actually. And um, this has been uh, tested like I've never seen anything else tested at the RFU before. Um, including with players, administrators, user groups, uh, staff. I mean, it still goes on daily right up until the launch, but I'll talk specifically about the player testing programme. I'll give you a flavour of what a registration will look like for a university player playing university rugby and also what a club administrator acceptance of that uh, registration will look like. And then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end there for some question and answers and talk a little bit about our next steps. So key principles. So for those of you who are currently familiar with um, adult player registration in uh, in rugby union, you may know that at the moment some players have to register to be able to play rugby union at our member clubs. And that typically is people who have been uh, playing RFU league and cup rugby. As you'll know, it's not been a compulsory, certainly from an RFU perspective, it's not been a compulsory thing or a mandatory thing or a regulatory thing for players to be registered with their university, which is a member of the RFU. But obviously that is, um, that is changing as we uh, come into next season. So all players will register to play at their clubs. So the registration exercise, and in particularly for students, is a player-led task, and you'll see the technology walk through uh, in a couple of minutes on that. So it's a player-led task where the players will work with their GMS accounts and use those to register to play university uh, to play rugby at their university club. It does include all formats, all levels within all of our member clubs. So when we get asked and say yes, but the likes of Jamie George isn't are doing this, are they? Yes, they are. They're doing exactly the same task and certainly the initial task that I'll be walking you through in a couple of minutes' time. Every single player will be doing this, providing that they're a, a, a member club um, of the RFU. Just one caveat there, the specific non-contact registration element of that. So we're not talking about people here who rock up before training and do 10 to 15 minutes touch before they get going. We're talking about people who play specifically T1 rugby, uh, touch rugby and walking rugby. That element of this rollout will be coming uh, April next year to coincide with typically when that season starts. Um, student uh, passes will still be available. Um, they are really well, uh, sorry, they are really lowly used in numbers and we want to use this as an opportunity to showcase those. So student passes are not what some people might think and they can be totally forgiven as to why they're not a pass for students to play rugby at their university. It is a function where players can use if they're eligible and apply for uh, to be able to play at 
a club near to their university as well as still play for their club when they go home. So the scenario might be, let's say, somebody is from Newcastle, which is where I am. They're registered at a club called Nova Castrians. They go to Exeter to play university. They would register to play rugby with Exeter University, but they can also apply to play uh, for a student pass, which would allow them to go and play for another local club on a Saturday, uh, typically near to Exeter. So they can still get some weekend rugby if they wanted to without having to travel all those hundreds of miles back to, back to Nova Castrians. All of the registration processes will be fully embedded within GMS. So if some of you are um, familiar with the student pass here and have helped some students in the past to facilitate that to become available, you may be familiar that that's a complete offline process at the moment, which still involves posting and forms and things. All of that is going and everything will be completely fully embedded within, within GMS. Players will be required to renew their registration each season. That is not a full re-registration of the process I'm going to show you so, uh, show you shortly. But it will just be a, a quick login, a little bit of a tick box. Do you still want to play rugby at this university, for example? Tick a box, say yes, and that would, that play, that would be that player ready to go. And then um, just calling out specifically, there are some flexibilities blended into what we mainly call the lower levels, but we don't obviously refer to that for universities, but broadly across the game by lower levels, we mean lower down the, the men's and women's leagues. Uh, those flexibilities will include, for example, that there are obviously some regulations attached to the to the um, to the club game. By club game, we mean you know your typical RFU league and cup games. There's some regulations attached to those which don't allow uh, often a lot of flexibility of movement. When it comes to university and services, you'll see in a second, then those players will be able to infinitely register for as many university sides as they wish to. So if um, uh, University of Durham, which I know reasonably well from back in the day, if they wanted to register for Collingwood College and also wanted to register for the second team for books and uh, and another uh, and another societal type team, then that is that is completely fine. So lots of lots of flexibility blended in at those levels. So in here, I'll do, we'll walk these through step by step. Uh, fundamental principles specifically for universities and services. Um, we 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 use the same material. Um, in a lot of theatres rather than re reinvent the wheel. So the universities and services, and what we mean by services is Army, Navy, Royal Air Force, are very, very similar. In fact, almost identical, uh, identical in terms of registration type. So player registers to play. The club registrar, registrar at those uh, clubs will accept or decline that player's registration. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like in a couple of minutes' time. That is that player then immediately registered and available to play. So if you've got some people on here who are familiar more with the typical RFU League and Cup uh, game where you've heard of, where you may be familiar with, or have heard of things like seven-day wait periods, expedited registrations, can only become available to play the next day, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and transfers and what have you, that will not apply in the university or service sectors. So once a player registers to play, uh, and once a, a club registrar accepts that, then they will be immediately um, satisfying what will what is Regulation 13, and they'll be available to play. What you'll also see in the bottom left-hand side there is that we will have blended into the technology the functionality for players to retros be retrospectively registered. So particularly in, you know, further down the teams in books, which was uh, sadly not by choice, but was definitely the area that I played when I was at university, then your players can become available late in the day, get them doing their activate warm-up stuff, get them on the field, and then they could retrospectively register after the game. What's written into regulation there is that they, they would do that by, by 12 noon every Tuesday, for example. So if you had a player who uh, became available on a Wednesday, they hadn't registered, then to satisfy the regulation requirement, then as long as they did that by the following Tuesday, 12 noon, then that would be all that, oh, that completely satisfied as far as that's concerned. Um, there's no limit, as I said already, on the number of clubs that university and services players are providing they're playing university rugby. That's obviously different if they're playing RFU league rugby, and I'll touch on that a little bit later on. This does not impact upon other club registrations. So if you do end up, I hope you don't, because I hope our messaging is pretty clear on this, but I guess it's inevitable we may get some queries. If you do get some local clubs where your students do play, if they say yes, but you, they either need to register for you or for us, that is not the case when we're talking about university rugby, we're talking about non-RFU leagues here. 
So if you had, I'll use Durham again because it's pretty, pretty near. So if you had a player who was registered to play Bucks Rugby at Durham University, they could be registered with Collingwood College and any other intramural or intercollegiate team within Durham University, that would not impact upon their typical RFU club registrations where they would play on a weekend. So it's not one or the other. Uh, regulation 13 is, is the real boring bit in terms of where this comes under and you'll see those regulations go live and I'm sure you can't wait to read those when they do so when we go live with this over the summer um, and in the regulations what you'll see here and, and um, hopefully is some language which would hopefully give the university sector a little bit of reassurance in terms of how the regulations are going to be applied here um, I'm not going in purposefully to, to the, the exact slides that we've used for like men's and women's premiership because it doesn't apply today. But if I was to do that, you would see a, a pretty different tone of language from what you can see in the bottom right there. So this is regulated activity and has been voted through by RFU Council to become regulation for next for next season. But there is very, very much an acceptance that in this sector, probably more than any other, it is a pretty big change and it is something that it will take a while we understand that for universities and their players to potentially uh, come to grips with. So um, I guess we've always got to toe the line here and say it is in regulation and it will be a mandatory requirement, but there's, no good, but there's going to be nobody with binoculars through edges looking to see who's on the pitch and if they're registered or not. Very, very much a supportive uh, approach uh, on this one. I'll just talk about some of the testing that we've done for, uh, with players. So throughout May, uh, throughout March, sorry, we visited 12 sites across the country at every level. So we did everything from men's and women's premiership. Uh, we did some army sides. Uh, we did some. Uh, we did imperial um, uh, uh, on the university sector. Worked with Katie and Johnny to make sure that obviously that sector was represented in the testing. And we engaged with over 200 players and showed them the technology because it's actually been developed for quite a while. We're talking pretty minor, uh, minor refinement stuff at this stage. And what we got there was we got some really good feedback from players uh, and indeed from administrators in terms of how they felt, felt it was going to reduce workload. And that is typically from uh, administrators who are currently registering players. It's obviously important and appreciative here to call out. This is a change for the university sector. This is something new. And we, we, do, ex we do accept and hopefully we can support each other as much as possible on this, that we could be looking at a bit of a short-term pain here to, to look at that longer-term game of being able to um, you know, articulate and illustrate exactly what um, how uh, buoyant the university sector is. The full um, account creation and registration range from between two minutes forty and five minutes. And really important to call out here, they only need to do both of these steps if they have no presence in GMS at all currently. So if you have players arriving at your university that have at some point um, or indeed have a current age grade registration when they reach you or indeed a current adult registration when they, reach you, uh, when they reach you, they will not need to create a new account. They will just need to interact with that existing account, join your university organisation and then register, uh, register to play there. OK, so what I'll um, go on to now, uh, I'm conscious of time there, is we'll look at those steps specifically. So we're going to look at the account creation side of things first. And just being clear that it is only people who have no presence in uh, GMS whatsoever currently that will need to create an account. Like I say, if they've got a current age grade registration or a, um, a registration at a club in any way, shape or form, or indeed a volunteer role, they already by default have a GMS account and do not need to create a new one. For some of you who are familiar with GMS, you may look, and that might not be many of you, but for those of you who are familiar, you may see that this looks different and GMS is benefiting from a um, significant facelift, as it were, and you'll see this all go live um, as we roll out over the summer. This is what the player will be presented when they do something like scan a QR code or do the, the register to play URL that we're going to be sending out as a part of our campaign stuff. They'll be clicking on create a new account and they'll be presented with typically some uh, minor or a small number of uh, critical data fields that they would need to create that account in GMS. They will essentially populate those. This is obviously a dummy account, of course, but they want to populate that with the critical data fields, which are typically aligned with most sign-up platforms. You'll see the asterisks in the board left online. line. So these are fields that they would definitely need to complete. They would create a password. 
and then they would go through the exercise here of uh, opt-ins, consent, and all those types of things. And then once they'd click, uh, once they then click uh, next on the top here, uh, and this will change by the way to say submit along the bottom when this gets launched. That essentially is them with a GMS account, and that is them completely all done and completely ready to go. In terms of then being able to register to play at uh, a university. They would then be presented with their dashboard, uh, if you like, which is what you're seeing here. And let's say this player typically currently plays for Sales Sharks RFC. So they're on GMS with Sales Sharks RFC as an organization. They're not currently registered with them yet, but let's say they've been a volunteer there or whatever it might be. They would then need to have a look at and find and search their university. They would click on my organization over here, highlighted by these red boxes. They would search for their university over here on the right hand side. A list of those would appear on the right hand side. In this case, it's a club, but you can already see that there are some educational establishments there down the right hand side. They would find that organization. Oops, sorry, excuse me. And then what they would do here is they would then be presented with this register now button. So this nice and a big change for those who are familiar with the process from previously. They'd be presented with this register to, to play button. They can either do it here right in front of them, which is pretty unmissable, or they can have a look at the quick links on the right hand side. They'll then be presented with a player registration form. And then what you'll um, see as you come further through this is all of the information down here is already pulled through from that player's um, GMS account. They do not need, unless they want to edit it, they don't need to re-input the information they've already used within their GMS account. So just so we're clear again, if they've already got a GMS account, which they will have to get to this stage, but if they have not to create one of the same steps, all of this information will be there uh, and populated for them on the form. If they've just created the account today, then that too will come across as into this player registration form for that player. <laughs> They'll go through some data sets here that they need to uh, complete. So medical notes, it's it's one of, if not the only um, data sharing that they need to do each time they join a new organization to get that kind of digital transaction in place. Medical notes need to be shared with every club that they're registered for. They must complete into here an emergency contact. They then go through the uh, required waivers, opt-ins, and consent side of things. You'll then also see, as I've said, the information already coming across from their GMS account. They then click on Submit. That is the player done. So that is that player registration now requested by that player uh, to play at their, their university or their club or whatever it whatever it is. I'll, I'll keep going so I can show you all the process because, like I say, I'm conscious of time and then you can walk back, uh, watch back at your leisure. And at the end, I'll touch on about what we're going to do next step for further engagement over the summer. And now you can see that's that player in, in terms of sales, sales sharks, which is what we use as the test club. You can see that that player there is player adult men. You'll see, hopefully, that that is uh, an orange shirt icon, which uh, which uh, um, uh, means that that player's registration is pending. So what we're looking at now is the admin side of things. So this is uh, essentially a registrar at the university. They will log into their account. And again, if you are familiar with GMS, um, you will see that this has got a completely different look and feel. And this is essentially where they will land when they log into their account as a registrar and as an administrator. You'll see down the bottom right hand side here in their quick links and in their kind of task dashboard, they will see that you will see that they've got some pending senior men's registrations for the example of this um, of the example of this process. They would then click on that link down the bottom. And then what the, um, if they wanted to, or what they can do is they can also have a look up here and they can use the quick links on the tiles on the left hand side. So when we go to what is, I think, um, termed as the waffle these days, they would click on that top left. They would then have a look at the player management tile. And then what they'll be presented with here is essentially a, a registrar's dashboard as it's termed and then what you'll be able to see are depending on the registration rights that each person has got you may indeed see all of these so if you had senior men's registrar women's registrar an age grade registrar you would see all of these three tiles 
or these three buckets. And, and of course, if you don't have those, then you see the ones you've got the respective rights and rules for within GMS. You'll see on the top left hand side here that you've got a list of rejected registrations, pending registrations, and approved registrations. So those players and the registrar that has already gone through that process. For this purpose, we're obviously going to look at pending registrations because we've just run through a player that has uh, applied to uh, register to play. We click on pending registrations and that takes us to the number of players that are currently pending sitting there who have applied to register to play at the club, but the registrar is yet to process these. And as you can see, our test account there, Samwise Gamgee, is here. We then select, we can do a number of things here. We can either select all of these players en masse or we could select them individually. And then once we do that, and uh, if we click on Sam, for example, it can bring up, should somebody want to check, it can bring up the data field so that that player has completed. Now, you don't have to go through and check these, but registrars can do that if they want to. Maybe it's a name they don't quite recognise, but they might recognise by, by another data field. That is completely within your um, poetic licence to, to do that, should you wish. You'll see all of the information on the right-hand side that's come from that uh, Sam's GMS account into his player registration and, of course, into that registration that's been submitted. And then you can close down those data fields. You can open up the emergency contacts just to check that they've got one, but they wouldn't be able to allow to submit it without one. And then you can have a look here, uh, and this was created yesterday, for example. So you can have a look here that this type of registration, as I said earlier, they would be immediately available to play. This was all created yesterday uh, for the series of webinars that we're doing for the whole game um, from now on until July. So you can see that straight away that player would be uh, effectively registered from today. You can have a look at their previous registrations if you wanted to, probably more relevant for the typical club game, but that information is there if you wanted to have a browse through. And then what we can do here, once we've selected Sam Wise, you can see that the um, information or the buttons and functionality top right has opened up. I'll just go back a step so you can see that. You can see approve registration, reject registration top right. What we're doing here is we've selected Sam. We're going to approve that registration. You'll see that that player has now been removed from the pending players list. We can then return to the dashboard should uh, should we wish to, but just to prove their all does work, you'll be able to see that the pending re registrations has moved from th uh, four to three and approved registrations has moved from uh, 18 to 19. Again, you can do this individually for players or you can do it completely en masse. It is entirely up to the registrar how they want to, uh, how they want to play that. You then have a look at the approved registrations. If you wanted to double check that that had gone through, even though we could see that the numbers have changed, and you can see that Sam Wise has now appeared in that um, registered player list for that club or for that university. I'm just going to stop there for a second. I've got a few more bits to go into, but I'll just come off share in second uh, for a second. Even though I'm working off two screens and a phone, it's not always easy to see the chat. So I'll just pause there to see if anybody's got any pertinent burning questions into the chat at all which it doesn't look like we have so i shall crack on on that one um, but do keep firing them in and i will try my best to get through them as much as i possibly can okay what we're going to have a look at now if i can get the um slides to move on there we go is what is Currently, or, or, or on a lot of um, people's lips, is all oh, right. What happens with sanctions and regulations and things like that? Will we get into trouble? What I'm showing you here is something that will be released to the game over the summer when the regulations go live. Appreciate it's quite a small copy. So I'll zoom in for you there um, a little bit to have a look at. I mentioned earlier and referenced that the information that was shown in that universities and services slide is distinctly different or, or is noticeably different, sorry, to what you may see further up the pyramid as it were. And again, you can see this reflected a little bit here in the um, sanctions table. So you'll see here that it mends premiership uh, uh, level one as it is down to level four, which is the national leagues. You will see that there is a fixed ineligible player sanction. There is no change on that. There are no suspensions. There are no changes in the guidance to the organising committees and the disciplinary committees who run that area of the game. 
what you will start to see as we move through the pyramid, where essentially these um, levels are potentially experiencing the, experiencing the most change, you will start to see a little bit of a step change here where people um, and organising committees and, of course, the clubs that play within those organising committees will be able to take advantage or use to their um, discretion suspensions and things like that. And what we mean by suspensions is we don't mean outright suspensions. We mean any sanctions being suspended. Um, and you'll see that as we come further down this list here, it does start to change. You'll see, for example, in regional one in men's level five, um, it's the first month, essentially. And there'll be an expectation that that part of the game will need to be um, fully up to speed with it. But as we come through this list, here, you will start to see a uh, more flexibility, more of an understanding that the supportive element is going to be really, really crucial in this one. Um, and that the organising committees and the competitions that they play within or the clubs that play within those organisations uh, competitions will be able to um, have this at their disposal to make sure that the rollout of adult player registration is being uh, done so in a supportive way. And you'll see the same reflected down the bottom with the women's as well. Uh, last couple of things from me uh, before I pause to any questions, if there are any. One key thing to take away from this is that players will need an up-to-date verified email address on their GMS account to be able to do this. And I'll make sure that when all of the information that comes out from Elisa at the end of this, you've got all of the links to the guidance and, and information that's been going out to the game on this, so you'll be able to see how they do it. So you could have a, a player with a GMS account, but they haven't verified their email address you'll be able to easily see within your organisations if that is the case or not. And again, we'll not go through all of that now because of time, but I will make sure you get all the support and information to have a look at that and how to do that. But it's really, really important. If the players, uh, and you'll be lucky actually in your sector because a lot of these players will already be coming to you with the verified accounts that they've been using in the club game. If for some reason they don't have a verified email address and they're thinking, I can't register or whatever, you'll be able to check in your organisation and on their account to see if their email is verified. And as I say, I'll chuck some links into the chat later on and in the information that Elisa send out to make sure you've got some information on that. I'll just talk quickly about what the next steps are. This is just one part of our support, obviously, and our partnership and collaboration with the rollout of this into the university game, working really closely with Katie and the SRFU committee to make sure that this is just the start of uh, the information that you guys will receive. Uh, granted, um, you, uh, university sector typically starts playing a little bit later than the more traditional RFU men's uh, and women's leagues. So as we go through the summer, we'll be doing a, a lot more online sessions for you, optional drop-ins, content that we'll be able to get around the universities, marketing collateral to uh, drive players to register. But this is the first step. And if anybody's got any key points they want to put into the chat in terms of more supportive things like this that they would want to see, then put those in the chat. I'll take that away with the team and then we'll make sure it's blended into the to the rollout further on in the summer. Um, bit of a whistle-stop tour, but that's that's essentially... Essentially, me for today. I'll I'll pass back over to Katie and I'll have a look at the questions in the chat and answer as many as I can. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, there haven't been uh, too many questions. Um, Good. Anita, Good. just <laughs> just confirming that yes, it it will be a requirement. But as Matt says, um, we'll be working with institutions to to implement it. So we're not going to come and hit you over the head for not not complying in the first season. It's it's transitioned to full implementation. So um, we want to work with you to make it successful because by making it successful we get the data that gives us the evidence as to the the great amount of rugby activity that's going on in in universities so um yeah thank you yeah Thanks, and, and, and as well as that and as well as that katie sorry to cut across you is um i did mention earlier it is a part of our digital transformation piece um as an organization and what it will allow us to do in the future, if we can have that digital relationship with players, there's no expectation here that the RFU in terms of that digital relationship would ever replace the relationship that uh, individual universities and clubs would have with their players. But having that digital relationship will allow us to be able to campaign with those players to keep them playing, whether that be in the university sector or beyond or wherever that might be. And that's very, very much a big part of this. Great, thank you. Katie, anything else from, from your perspective? No, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everybody for attending. I think that's the one of the highest turnouts for ADM that I can remember, but Elisa will probably tell me otherwise. 
Brilliant. Uh, Matt, before you dash off, there's just a question that's popped in from, from Cy Cully. Of course, that was the first mute of the day. Um, yeah, great shout, Simon. Um, so uh, electronic match cards uh, are mandatory in regulation for men's and women's RFU leagues and cups, and they will be remaining that way for the, all of our member clubs. There was uh, a time when we were considering making those mandatory for all of uh, games from our member clubs across uh, the country. Um, but the Council Oversight Group, of which Mark is a member of that, took the view that that was probably a bit too much for, for the game to do in one go. However, there was obviously that pilot that we did um, last summer uh, or starting last summer, which we did for BSR and WNL. So that's something that we'll continue to work with the SRFU committee on and indeed books to see if that's potentially rolled out again or indeed expanded. But from a regulation point of view, there's no expectation that the things like intramural games would need to um, undertake an electronic match card, certainly for next season anyway. Right. Thanks, Matt. That was really clear. Uh we're in danger of finishing on time. Uh, so before I draw this thing to a close, does anybody else have any questions they'd like to raise before we finish? No. Well, thank you all so much for uh, attending today and for your engagement, uh, particularly with the, the RFU proxy votes. We really appreciate it. Katie, Matt, thank you for that really thorough overview of, of GMS. Uh, I think we've put in the chat already that uh, Matt's section will be cut and we'll send it out as, as a resource so you can watch back as you, as you go through this process. But there'll be other resources available on, on, on our website as well. So, uh, yeah, thank, 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 thank you again. Uh, we'll be in touch with you uh, back end of the summer as we start to roll out the behaviour charter for the next year, uh, plus all the other engagement opportunities. So. Enjoy your summers and we look forward to seeing you at the start of the next season. Thank you.